In this video, I'm going to give an overview of the NumPy Python data science library. NumPy is an abbreviation for numeric Python and deals with numeric arrays. And it's essentially the basis of most of the other data science libraries. So if you haven't already done so, make sure you've installed the Anaconda Python distribution. And I've got detailed instructions for Windows and Ubuntu. And also make sure you're comfortable with the core Python programming language. I'm going to cover some basics again before starting with the NumPy library. However, it's going to be helpful if you understand procedural programming, um, Python code blocks and object oriented programming before getting started with any of the data science libraries. And I've already put together a fairly detailed written guide and this video will roughly follow the same structure and I'll leave a link to it in the video description as well as some timestamps. So most, if not all of the code in this video will also be in the written guide if you want to copy and paste something as well. Okay, so let's start with the spider IDE. And let's create a new script file. So I'm just going to save this to my documents folder. And I'm going to save it as numpy underscore arrays. Okay, so let's create two numbers. So let's create num1 and num2. And they're both of the type int. So int is their class. And if we type in num1 dot, we see we've got a list of properties and functions that we can call from the object num1. And these are defined in the num1's blueprint, i.e. its class, the integer class. So if we type in int dot, then we see the same list of functions and properties. And we get the same thing if we type in num2 dot or num1 dot, because these are both instances of the int class. So if we scroll through this list of properties and functions, we see that many begin and end with a double underscore. And they're colloquially known as double underscore methods or dunder methods, but more properly known as data model methods. So the double underscore in it double underscore or initialization data model method is used to initialize an instance of the class. Now for a number, we can use the int class directly and then as the input arguments, insert a number, or we can just type in a, an integer number to create an instance of the int class because it's a primitive data type. Okay, so we've got this data model method add and we can access this directly from an instance. I notice when we do so, we only need to provide a value. And what gets returned is self plus value. We can also access this directly from the class itself. Now the class is an abstract object, so it's like a blueprint, it's not an actual physical object. So we need to provide the instance self, which is going to be num1 and then we need to provide the value that we're going to add it to and once again we get the same value and this data model method add is mapped to the plus operator so you see when we do num1 plus num2 we get the same result let's now have a look at another numeric data type the float so now this has a different blueprint it's got the blueprint, the float, or the class, the float. And you see it's got similar methods to the int class, but they are slightly different. So if I just create a screenshot of both of these, you'll see that they're very slightly different. So for instance, in the float class, there's an additional method to check whether something is an integer. So now let's move on to the next most commonly used data type, the string. So I'm going to clear the variable explorer and 
clear the contents in the script file and create two strings, hello and world. So note in the variable explorer these display as strings and if I type in text one dot then all the functions and properties are related to text. However, you'll see some of the similar data model methods that you've seen with the other classes, the int and the float. So if we use the add data model method in the same manner as before, we see that we don't actually add the two strings together numerically, we instead concatenate them. So this creates a new string hello world and note that there's no space between hello and world because there's no space in either of the original strings. All right, so now let's move on to the inbuilt collections such as the list. And the list can be used to store numeric values. So let's create two lists and if we have a look at the functions and properties from a list, we once again see we've got some of the data model methods such as add. So if we attempt to use this with two lists, what actually happens is we concatenate the two lists together. So it's got a similar behavior to the add data model method used in a string. And in the case of two equally sized numeric lists, the two lists are concatenated and it's maybe not as you would expect it to. So if we wanted to add the values at each matching corresponding index to create a new list of added values, then we would need to use a for loop. So let's enumerate over nums1 and then we're going to create this empty list num3 and then we're going to append the value of nums1 and nums2 which we can access by using the index of the for loop. So let's just print end at the end of this and we can go ahead and debug it. So we see as we debug it what the index is and now we see what the value is and now when we move on to next step we've added one and two together which is three and is now appended to nums three so moving on now the index is one so we've added two and four together and this is six and this is appended to nums three and so on so we get the result, but the code is a bit cumbersome for such a simple operation. And obviously, if we were to convert this into something like a matrix, then we would need to use multiple for loops or a nested for loop. One other limitation with a list is that, and it's an advantage in some other cases, is that we can have different data types for each element in a list. So for example, I can have the second last element in nums one as being a string. And so when we attempt to do the same thing, well, we actually get this error because we're attempting to add a string and an int together. And as we've seen in both cases, the add data model method has a completely different function for these two blueprints and therefore Python doesn't know what to do and throws up an error. Okay, so let's now have a look at trying to create a matrix. So we can create a matrix as a list of lists. And the important thing to note is that it is a list of lists. So we see the size here is two, and then each element in the list, the list has a size of five. And then each element in one of these nested lists is an int. So when we go to index here, then we need to select the element 
of the outer list and then we need to select the element of the inner list. So remember nums3 and then index0 is a list itself and then this square brackets with number 2 is telling us we want the value at the second index of this nested list. Okay, so we've got some other data types that you should be familiar with, such as the tuple. And a tuple is essentially a list that can't be mutated. So if we have a look at the list of functions and properties from a list and a tuple, we see that the tuple has a very small subset of those available in a list. Although a tuple is created using round brackets, we still index into it using square brackets. And when creating a tuple with a single element, the brackets get confused with parentheses. So we need to add a comma behind a single element in order to get a tuple. And then the next inbuilt collection that you should be familiar with is a dictionary, which has key value pairs. And the keys are normally strings, and the values can be of any of the data types that we've seen before. So in this case, we've got the keys num1 and nums2, and each of these has their own list. So notice when I open up this in the Variable Explorer that we don't have a numeric index, we instead have a key. And we index using the key, and because the key is a string, we need to place quotations around it when we index using it. So once again, we use the square brackets to index. And we can use the method keys and values to access the keys and values essentially as two separate lists. Let's now move on to NumPy. So the first thing we need to do is import NumPy as NP. So let's go to our user profile folder and then go to Anaconda3 and then lib and then site packages. So this is a third party library and it's installed in site packages. And if we go to the numpy folder, we see we've got this double underscore in it double underscore dot py file, which is in the name of the folder numpy. So this is what we are referring to when we import this file. And because this is not an inbuilt Python library, it's not a standard Python library, although it's a commonly used um, data science library, we need to make sure that this is run in the console so we can access the objects from the NumPy library. So the NumPy library is built around this ND array class which is a class for numeric arrays. So we can highlight this and we can press Ctrl and I to inspect it and this should open up the help in the help pane. Now, unfortunately, it's not so great and it just gives you generic information about the NumPy library. If we type in question mark and then numpy.nd array in the console, then we get a uh, more focused help, which is actually talking about the ND array class. So we can create an instance of this class by specifying a shape in the form of a tuple and then a data type. So notice that this has some garbage values in it. We haven't specified what any of the values in this array should be but it has the dimensions that we specified, two rows and three columns. And notice that the data type of the entire array is float64 and we don't have the data type mentioned separately for each cell as we would have if we were using a list. And notice that this is one object, so we can index into it using a single set of square brackets, specifying the row and then the column. So let's change the value at row zero and column zero to one 
and change the value at row zero and column one to two. And notice that the changes are displayed within the Variable Explorer, but not in the open window. And notice that when I run the script file again, that the existing values are still there. So they weren't defaulted back to the garbage values that were previously used. They're still just using the current version of, of the garbage values. Okay, so now that we've created this array, notice that we've got this data model method add again. And this time if we add a number, it's going to add the number to each element in the array. So these numeric arrays are set up for numeric operations as expected, unlike a list, for example. So if we type in np.ndarray dot, we'll see a list of properties and functions that we can call from an instance of the ND array. Now in the NumPy library, it's more common to just call functions directly from the NumPy library. So instead type in NP dot, and it's much more common to use the array function to create a new NumPy array from an existing object such as a list. So if I use a list of ints, then the data type is automatically going to be detected as an array of ints. I can override this to flow if I wanted to. Okay, so if I change one of the data points from an int to a flow, such as 1.2, now you see that the data type has been automatically detected as a float. And I can over override this by specifying an int, but the point two has essentially been chopped away from the, the value that we specified in the object. And if the object is a list of lists, then we're actually going to create a matrix. So once again, we see that it's got a single data type. And when we explore this in the Variable Explorer, we can see it's a single object. Okay, so let's now create a more complicated object. So this is going to be a list of lists of lists. So you'll see when I'm using spider that I'm trying to match up the brackets to reflect this. And you'll notice that when I highlight a bracket, its matching bracket is, is highlighted in correspondence. So I forgot a bracket there and you've seen that it wasn't aligned as expected. Okay, so that, that'll do. Let's have a look at this within the Variable Explorer. So now we see it's got three dimensions. And when we open this up in a variable explorer, we actually only see a matrix. And we actually are slicing through this 3D array to show the matrix at each page of this 3D array. So if we have a look at the matrix, we've got two rows by five columns. And if we have a look at the page, we've got three pages by two rows by five columns. If instead we approach from the right hand side, then we've got five columns by two rows and we've got five columns by two rows by three pages. So the higher dimension is added to the left hand side of the size that we see in the variable explorer, which is actually the shape. And then the other dimensions are shunted along to the right. Okay, so we see we've got this slice and it's page zero, all rows and all columns. So we can change this to page one and page two. And we can actually use this notation to create a more complicated array. 
So let me just create page zero in the form of a matrix. And then I'm going to create page one in the form of a separate matrix. And notice that these two matrices have the same dimensions. So I can create page two, which will once again also have the same dimensions and we'll have three separate matrices. And now I'm going to use the NumPy function zeros, which can be used to create an array of zeros by specifying the shape as a tuple. So if we approach this from right to left, then we've got five columns, two rows and three pages. And as you see, everything is zero in this, this array as expected. We've got a related function ones, which will create ones for every element instead of zeros. And we can multiply this by a scalar to get any other value that we want. Okay, so let's return this to zeros. And now what we can do is we can index into this matrix so we can index into page zero and then replace it with our matrix page zero so now you see that this page has been updated and the other two pages are still zeros so we can just copy and paste this and modify it for page one and page two respectively and this gives us the same 3D array that we've seen before. Otherwise, this can be conceptualized as a book. So we can think of a shelf as containing multiple books and each book is the same size. So we might even think of this as volumes of books and they're all stored on the same shelf. So let me just call this volumes. And this time we're going to have two books. Each book's going to have three pages, two rows and five columns. Or better, read from the left. Five columns, two rows, three pages and two volumes. So the variable explorer won't let us see this 4D array. But what we can do is index into each volume and assign it to a book. And bear in mind that each book has the same dimension. So next we can think of a bookshelf as containing shelves which each have an equal amount of volumes on each shelf. So once again this can be thought of from right to left as five columns, two rows, three pages, two volumes and then two shelves. And then to each shelf we can assign the volume that we want or the set of volumes that we want rather. So it gets harder to conceptualize as we increase in the number of dimensions. But now think of it as a set of shelves where each shelf has an equal number of volumes and each volume has an equal number of pages and each page has an equal number of rows and each row has an equal number of columns. And then you could think of this stack of shelves as belonging to a library which contains multiple stacks of shelves. And then you can think of the library as belonging to a collection of libraries which would give you more and more dimensions. So I'll be sticking to the lower number of dimensions just because these are easier to work with, to understand, and we also use these every day. So um, one day array can essentially be used for X data and another one day array can be used for Y data when we're um, plotting a line graph. And for a 2D array, we can think of this as a black and white picture. A 3D array, we can think of this as a color picture, which has a red, green, and blue channel. And a 4D array, we can think of as a video 
which has time frames as well. So let's have a look at the shape in more detail. So we've got page zero, which is a matrix, and it's got two dimensions. And if we want the number of columns, then we're going to need to select the, the first index, which is at the end. And now let's have a look at the book instead, which has, has pages, rows, and columns. So in order to get the number of columns now, we're actually going to need to go to index two because we've increased the number of dimensions by one. And for the number of volumes, we're going to need to go to index three to get the number of columns because once again, we've increased index by one. So instead of approaching the problem left by right, let's approach the problem right by left. So if we go one before zero, we get minus one. And notice that in all cases, if we select the minus one index, we get the number of columns as expected. So therefore it's more consistent if we use minus one to select the number of columns. And we can use index minus two to select the number of rows. And this will work for any array that's two dimensions or higher. And we can use index minus three to select the page number, which will, again will work for any array that has three dimensions or higher. Okay, so we're using the function shape to determine the shape of the array. Each array has a size, which is essentially the product of the shape. And although in the variable explorer, it displays size, what actually displays for a NumPy array is the shape because it's a more useful property. And the reason the variable explorer displays the word size opposed to shape is because the inbuilt Python classes don't have a shape, they only have a size. So this is the int, the float, the bool, the string, the list, the tuple in the dictionary. So don't get size and shape confused when working with NumPy arrays because you see size displayed in the variable explorer. So just to recap, we can get the size by using the function numpy.size and we can get the shape by using numpy.shape and the number of columns is going to be the negative first index of the shape. The number of rows is going to be the negative second index of the shape. And the number of pages is going to be the negative third index of the shape. And once again, we're approaching the shape from right to left opposed to left to right. And this is because a new axis is added to the left, shifting all previous axes over to the right. So we've got a number of useful functions to create a numeric sequence. So we've got the function a range, which is an abbreviation for array range. And here we specify a start, stop and step value. So if I run this, you can see we're inclusive of the start value and exclusive of the stop value. And it works pretty much in I in an identical manner to the range function, which creates a range object. Now we can actually convert the range object into an array. And in this case, you see that the array is identical. So the a range function can use keyword input arguments, or it can use positional input arguments. And if we only specify two, the steps taken to be one. And if we only specify one, the starts taken to be zero and the steps taken to be one. So you'll notice that all of these generate the same array. So all the arrays go from zero to 10, inclusive of zero and exclusive of 10. If we want to be inclusive of 10 and start at one, then we're going to need to go from one 
211, so 211 in steps of 1 exclusive of the upper bound 11, which will take us to 10. So let's bear that in mind when we're going from a start of minus 5 to a stop of plus 5 that we're going to be inclusive of minus 5 and exclusive of plus 5. So if we want to be inclusive of plus 5, we're going to need to go to 6. And because the step is 1, this is 5 plus 1, which is 6. So we also have a related function, lin space, which will create a series of linear spaced points. So once again, we need to provide a start and stop value. And we also need to provide the number of steps instead of the spacing of an individual step. And notice that this gives an array of floats. And this is because we divide through by the number of steps. So we perform float division. And that's why everything is a float here. So we also have the function log space, which will give us log spaced data points. Once again, we need a start and a stop value and a number of data points. Okay, so let's go back to the A range function. And I'm only going to provide a single value, which will give me uh, an array that has 16 values in it from 0 to 16 exclusive of 16 in steps of 1. And we see the shape is 16 and the size is also 16 because the array is flat. Now we can reshape this using the reshape function. So we need to provide an array and then a tuple of the dimensions. So going from the right to the left, we've got four columns and four rows. And four times four is 16. So we can also reshape this square matrix into a rectangular matrix that will instead have eight columns and two rows going from right to left. And once again, the product of two and eight is 16. So if we try to reshape it to something that doesn't match 16, for instance, three columns by three rows, then we're going to get this value error. And we can reshape the matrix back into a flat array by using the shape, which is the dimensions of the flat array. We can also use minus one. So that will mean that we want all elements to be present in this axis of the reshaped array. So notice when we reshape an ar array, we go along the columns first, and then we go along the rows, and we occupy the dimensions of the output array. So you can see that we took the values 0, 1, 2, 3, and then the values 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, what we can do is transpose an array. So let's visualize this using a piece of paper writing the numbers at the front and the back. So this is equivalent of flipping the piece of paper around. And now the rows become columns and the columns become rows. And then if we like, we can reshape this transpose matrix to get um, output matrix that has eight columns and two rows. And you can see the difference between this matrix and the one that we had before when we didn't transpose anything. And then we can transpose this matrix as well. So now you see that the 0, 8 is beside each other in different columns opposed to in different rows. So in addition to transposing, we can also flip the matrix. So we can 
I've flipped the matrix left to right, which is going to work along axis minus one, which corresponds to columns. Or we can flip the matrix up down, which is going to work along axis minus two, which is the rows. So just for comparison, here you see the left right flip along the columns and you see the up down flip along the rows. In addition to the flip left right and flip up down, we've got the function flip and with flip we need to specify the axis that we want to flip. So if we select axis to equal minus one, we'll flip left right and just remember that minus one corresponds to the columns so we can think of this as working along the column axis likewise if we flip up down then we're going to select axis minus two which we can think of as working along the rows and once again we get the same results as before so this axis keyboard input argument is present in a lot of NumPy functions and make sure you understand it and how it ties into the shape and how we examine each axis moving from right to left. So columns minus one, rows minus two, and so on. So let's reshape this array into an array that's got four columns, two rows, and two pages. And think of page zero as being at the back and page one being at the front. And when we transpose this, what we are doing is flipping it like this. So this will give us the new page zero and then the new page one and new page two and the new page three and so on. So in order to understand this, you need to be able to visualize it as a 3D object. So let's go ahead and transpose it. I noticed that it's now got two columns, two rows and four pages. So the 3D array has essentially been flipped with respect to the original axis. So this gives us the page zero, page one, page two, and page three. Okay, so let's now have a look at a vector. So a vector has only got one dimension. Notice that its shape just says five comma. And if we view it in a variable explorer, it displays as a row, but if we open it up, it displays as a column. So this object should be thought of as neither a row nor a column. But in some cases, we're going to need it to be a row or a column, respectively. So in order to get it to be a column, we can use reshape. And when we use reshape, we want to specify one column and we want every element to be in its own unique row, so we can use minus one. Likewise, to get it as a row vector, we can specify minus one columns and one row. So notice now that in the variable explorer, the size is five comma one and one comma five, and this displays as a column both in the variable explorer and when it's expanded and the rvec displays as a row both in the variable explorer and when it's expanded and we can do this another way so when we index using a colon we're going to get all values and what we can do is add a new axis in the minus one position to get a column vector or a new axis in the minus two position to get a row vector and you'll see that this gives the exact same behavior as when we use reshape 
So having a row or column vector is important when we're going to use operations such as concatenation. So let's first of all create an array range from 0 to 9 exclusive of 9 and reshape this to be 3 columns by 3 rows going from right to left. And let's create a column vector that is one column by three rows going from right to left and a row vector that is three columns by one row going from right to left. Right, so in order to concatenate, because bear in mind, when we use the plus sign, we perform numeric addition, we need to use a concatenate function. And we need to specify a tuple of arrays to concatenate and then an access to concatenate them along. So if we've got the row vector and the matrix, we're going to want to concatenate against axis minus two, which corresponds to rows. And when we do this, the output matrix looks exactly as expected with the row vector on top of the matrix because this is the order that we specified them in the tuple. And we can also concatenate along axis minus one using the column vector and then the matrix. Notice that when we specify the wrong axis, we're going to get an error saying that the dimensions don't match. So this gives us the column vector and then on the values of the original matrix. And we can specify multiple values within the tuple. So for example, if we want to concatenate this column vector three times followed by the matrix, then we can update the tuple to, to do so. And as you see, this works as expected. Okay, so there are a number of operations that are carried out element by element. So let's just create two arrays that have identical shapes. So in both cases, we're going to use three columns by two rows going from right to left. So we've got M1 and M2 display in the variable explorer. And we can create a new array M3 by simply adding M1 and M2 together. So as you see, we've essentially went element by element and performed addition. And we've got the output matrix, which has the same dimensions. So we can also perform subtraction. And once again, this is carried out element by element. So we can carry out multiplication in much the same manner using the multiplication operator. We can raise matrix one to the power of matrix two using the power operator. And we can divide one matrix by another using float division or integer division using the same operators that we would use for the integer class. So for these operations, we need arrays that have matching dimensions. Now we can actually carry this out using a matrix and a row vector. And what will happen is we'll just expand the row vector along this, this axis. So we'll add the same row vector to every row of the matrix. And we could also expand along a column if we want as well. And if we use a scalar, it's going to expand along the column and also along the row. So if we add three to M1, we're going to create the output matrix M3 where every value of M1 has been added to three. So for row or vector expansion, we need to explicitly specify a row or column vector respectively. Let's create a, an array with some negative values and we can use the absolute function and negative function to once again work upon the array element by element. So with the absolute, we're going to make sure every negative value is positive. And if 
we use negative, we're going to reverse the sign of the original matrix. Let's create a matrix with decimal numbers and now we can use round to round to the integer or to round to one decimal place. We can use seal to round to the nearest largest whole number and we can also cast a matrix from a float to an integer by using numpy array and this will essentially chop off the decimal point. We can also create an array with complex numbers and we can use the conjugate function to get the complex conjugate which reverses the sign of the imaginary component. And each complex number can be drawn as a straight line on the real imaginary plane. And an angle can be created between a pair of complex numbers by measuring the angle between the two lines. So the angle given will be in radians and we can convert this into degrees using radians to degrees and we can convert from degrees to radians using degrees to radians. Once again, all of these operations are carried out element by element along the array. So NumPy has a number of inbuilt statistical functions. One of these is array max. So let's compare this with max. So max is going to find the maximum value in a list, for example. If we use it on an array, we're going to get an error. So we should use the function array max instead. And here we specify the array and then we want to specify the axis we're going to work along. So I'm going to work along the rows. So I'm going to use axis equals minus two and the output will be a vector and let's specify this to be a row vector. So it's easier to see within the variable explorer. So what we've done is take the maximum value of each row and this is given as 297 and now we can take the index of each of the maximum values which is row 1, row 0 and row 0 respectively. So we can do something very similar to get the minimum. And this is going to give us 1, minus 5 and 6. And it's going to be row 0, row 1 and row 1 respectively. So we can change this to axis equals minus 1. And this will work along the column axis instead of along the row axis. So in this case, let's use Amax again, specify the array as M1 axis as minus one and then we want to output this as a column so it displays correctly within the variable explorer. So the maximum value is nine and six which occur in column one and column two respectively. And we can use the argmax to, to get these indices. So we've used the axis minus one and minus two. We can also use the axis none, which will flatten the array and then find the, the maximum value of the complete array. So this is equivalent of reshaping the array using a tuple of minus one comma. And so the maximum value is nine at an index of one. And that one is the index within the flattened array. So now that we understand the Amax and argmax function, we can have a look at the sort and arg sort function, which will sort an array along an axis. So here we see that the array has been sorted along its rows. 
So 1, then 2, and then minus 5, and then 9, and then 6, and then 7. So this is the minimum row and maximum row, respectively. And if we have a look at the argsort, then we see that this is the indices of the minimum row and indices of the maximum row, respectively. And if we had an array with more dimensions, then we would have middle values as well. And we've got other statistical functions such as the sum, which again use an array and an axis. So I'm going to use axis minus one, which means I'm going to work along columns and I'm going to save the result as a column vector. So let's have a look at the sum and the product. So the sum is going to be one plus nine plus seven, which is 17 and two minus five plus six, which is three. The product's going to be one times nine times seven and two times minus five times six, which is 63 and minus 60 respectively. Okay, so let's now have a look at the mean. So we can calculate the mean from the sum and we essentially divide the sum by the number of values that we calculate the sum from. So we can get the number of columns as three. And so the mean is going to be the sum that we calculated divided by three. So we've also got the function sum which we'll calculate this by just using the array and the axis that we want to work along. And unsurprisingly, this gives us an identical result to, to earlier. Now, the mean is normally the value that's used to describe a row or a column, respectively. And in some cases, the mean can be distorted if you've got a small sample size and large outliers. So it's worth comparing this to the median, which is essentially the middle value along each axis. So in this case, this is seven and two. So as well as this mean or median central value, what we want is a way to describe the data around this mean or central value. So we can use the variance and what the variance is, is essentially it's each value subtracted by the mean squared. And then it's going to be divided by the number of values. And there's a small correction that's normally applied where we actually divide it by the number of values minus one. And this is known as the delta degrees of freedom. So here we see that we've got the variance of 17.3. And we've got the variance function, which we can use to calculate the variance by using the array and axis respectively. Now, by default, it's giving a different value. And this is because the delta degrees of freedom by default has a value of zero. So if we want to specify this to be one which is more commonly used, then we can use the keyword input argument delta degrees of freedom and assign it to one. And now we see that the value is exactly as we expect it to be. But the variance is in the dimensions of squared units. So quite often we take the square root of it. So this essentially gives us a variant metric that is in the same dimensions of the mean or central median value. And this is called the standard deviation. And we have a function to calculate the standard deviation directly, 
which is essentially uses the same form as the variance function. So we've got the array, the axis, and delta degrees of freedom to specify. Okay, so let's have a look at a NumPy array that consists of Boolean values. So this means that every value in the NumPy array is either true or false. So we can use the NumPy function all to determine whether everything along an axis is true. So once again, we specify the array and the axis. So in the top row, not everything is true, but in the bottom row, everything is true. So that's why we get false and true respectively. So we've also got the cumulative sum and cumulative product, which will calculate the sum and product as we work along an array. So one plus itself is one, one plus nine is 10, and 10 plus seven is 17. And likewise for the cumulative product, one times one is itself, one times nine is nine, and nine times seven is 63. Now, in addition to the cumulative sum and cumulative product, we also have the difference. Now, the difference works slightly different to the cumulative sum because it works along an axis and we don't take a value away from itself at the beginning, which would always give zero. So we're working along axis equals minus one, which means we're working along columns. So we've got nine minus one, which is eight, and then we've got seven minus nine, which is minus two. So as we're working along columns and we don't have the starting value, the number of columns is the same as the original output array, minus one. So instead of having three columns, we now have two columns in the output. So while we're looking at statistical functions, we can also calculate the correlation coefficient of a matrix, which essentially looks at the correlation between one row with respect to another row. So let me just create uh, a matrix that has two very similar rows. And in order to understand the correlation coefficient, I'm going to create a basic plot, which is going to plot the second row with respect to the first row. So this is going to be index zero for the first row and index one for the first row. So I'll need to import the plotting libraries. And then I want to plot the first row with respect to the second row, which is using zero index ordering, it's row zero, all columns, and then row one, all columns. So if we have a look at this plot, as we increase X, we see that Y is also increasing. And the correlation coefficient is essentially one. Now, if we have a look at the correlation coefficient matrix, what we have is essentially the correlation of the zeroth row with respect to the zeroth row, which is always going to be one because it's the same data. And so along the diagonal, it's always going to be one. What we're interested in is in the values along the anti-diagonal, which is the correlation of the zeroth row with respect to the first row and the correlation of the first row with respect to the zeroth row. And these are always going to give the same value. So we don't really care about what one of these two that we're going to look at. So let me just change the values in the second row. So it essentially goes up and down and there's no relation. Now, once again, we see along the diagonal that all the values are one because they're always going to be one because it's the same row correlated with itself. But across the anti-diagonal, we see that the correlation is now zero, which shows that as we increase X, it doesn't have an influence on Y. So let's change the data now. So 
Now, when we increase x, y actually decreases. So this will give us a correlation coefficient of minus 1, which means that as we increase the values across one of the rows, that the value in the other row is essentially going to go down. And you can mess about with the values so there's not such a strong relationship. And you can see that the correlation coefficient, it goes between 1 and minus 1, depending on what the relationship of the data in the two rows is. So most of the operations that we've had a look at so far have been carried out element by element. There's actually some operations that are carried out across arrays, known as array operations. And we can multiply using element by element multiplication or by array multiplication. And for array multiplication to take place, the inner dimensions of the two arrays being multiplied must match. So in this example, the first array has one row by two columns and the second array has two rows by one column and the inner dimensions of two match. And this means that we can carry out array multiplication. So let me just create some values here. And what we're doing is we're taking one and multiplying it by three. And then we're adding to this two multiplied by four. And so for every column in the first array, we need a corresponding row in the second array to carry out this array multiplication. So let me create these arrays v1 and v2 respectively and let me specify them as a row vector and a column vector respectively. So the inner multiplication, i.e. the largest dimensions being on the inside, is going to give us this value 11. Now we can actually perform an outer multiplication as well. So this would be V2 multiplied by V1. And now the outer dimensions are going to be two and the inner dimension is going to be one. So the inner dimension of one matches, so we can carry out array multiplication. So the output array is going to be a two by two array. And so what we're going to do is take three and multiply by one. And then we're going to take three and multiply by two. And then we're going to take four and multiply by one. And then we're going to take four and multiply by two. So for the inner multiplication, we can think of this as going about a shop and picking up a bunch of items and each item having a price. And so we are going to calculate how much we pay towards the end of our shop. So in the second case, you can think of this as a list of equipment and storage locations respectively. So you can have say three helmets and four harnesses uh, in two rooms that have one locker and two lockers respectively. So if you want each locker to have three helmets and four harnesses, then the output array is going to tell you how many helmets and harnesses you have to have for each room in order to fill these lockers up. So we used V1 and V2, and we specified them as a row vector and column vector respectively, and we performed inner and outer multiplication. We also have the inner and outer functions, which will work on vectors that are not explicitly specified as a row or column vector respectively. 
And as you see, the values returned are essentially the same as before. So let's move on to a more complicated problem. So let's perform multiplication of a multiple dimension array. So this array is going to have two pages and it's going to have three rows and four columns or going from right to left it's going to be four columns, three rows and two pages. And let's multiply this by a column vector. So this is going to have four rows and one column, or going from right to left, one column and four rows. So the inner dimensions of four match. And this means that the output matrix is going to have one column, three rows and two pages. So it's going to look something like the following. So let's just populate this with values. And then we can see how we can go ahead and multiply these. Okay, so this is going to be 1 times 0 0.1 plus 2 times 0 0.2 plus 3 times 0 0.3 plus 4 times 0 0.4 and this is going to give the value of 3. So we're going to have 5 times 0 0.1 plus 2 times 0 0.2 plus 7 times 0 0.3 plus 8 times 0 0.4 and this is going to give us the value of 7. And we can go through the rest of the array and see that we've got 11, 15, 19, and 23. So let's go ahead and create this, this book. So we're just going to use the um, A range function from 1 to 25 in steps of one and reshape it to an output array that has four columns, three rows and two pages going from right to left. And let's go ahead and create our column vector. And now we can just multiply these together. So let's just call the output book at column. And this gives us the same output array that we expect. So the opposite of array multiplication is array division. Now, unfortunately, there's some complications with this. So if we just copy and paste this original calculation that we made before, so We've got a result 11 on the right hand side. And now let's change this column vector from three and four to X and Y. So when we calculate this out, we have this equation, one X plus two Y equals 11. And what this means is we've got one equation and two unknown values. And this means that for whatever value of X we decide to fabricate, we can fabricate a value of y to suit this single equation. So in order to solve this, we're going to need a second equation. So we need two unique equations for two unknown variables. And more generally, we need n equations for n unknown variables. And this means that we are essentially limited to work working with square matrices when performing array division. So the array on the left hand side is always going to be 
a square matrix and the other arrays are going to be column vectors. So let's just read off our values. So 1x, 2y, 3x and 1y and uh, values are 11 and 10. Now, in order to solve this, we actually need to uh, perform matrix multiplication. And we use a special matrix known as the inverse matrix to perform matrix multiplication. So what we do is we multiply both sides of the equation by this inverse matrix. So let's take the left hand side first. So we've got minus 0 0.2 times 1 plus 0 0.4 times 3. So this is going to be minus 0 0.2 plus 1.2, which is 1. And then we've got minus 0 0.2 times 2 plus 0 0.4 times 1, which is minus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.4, which is 0. And then we've got 0 0.6 times 1 plus minus 0 0.2 times 3. So that's going to be 0 0.6 minus 0 0.6, which is 0. And then we've got 0 0.6 times 2 plus 0 0.2 times 3, which is going to be 1.2 minus 0 0.2, which is 1. So this entire thing simplifies down to a matrix which has 1 at its diagonals and 0 everywhere else, which is known as the identity matrix. Okay, so now let's perform the array multiplication on the other side. So we've got minus 0 0.2 times 11 plus 0 0.4 times 10. And then we've got 0 0.6 times 11 plus minus 0 0.2 times 10, which gives 1.8 and 4.6 respectively. So notice that when we multiply the identity matrix by this column vector, that this column vector is unchanged. So we can just read this across as x equals 1.8 and y equals 4.6. So you may be thinking, hold on a minute, the original values were 3 and 4, but array multiplication can have multiple solutions and from the equations that we, we have, these, these solutions are just as valid as the three and four that we originally started out with. So we can create an identity matrix by using the function i, and then we just need to specify the size of the identity matrix. Because it's square, we only need to specify a single dimension. We can take the diagonal of the identity matrix by using the diag function. And if we take the diagonal of a vector, we're going to get a square matrix where we've specified the value and every single other value is zero. Okay, so let's rephrase our problem now. So we're going to call the square matrix A, the result B, and the unknown coefficient C. And what we're trying to find out is C, which is the array of unknown coefficients. So we can go ahead and create this array A. And we can also go ahead and create this array B. Now, in order to solve this to get C, we're going to need to have a look at 
one of the other NumPy modules, which is the linear algebra module. So if we go back into the Anaconda 3 lib and then site packages folder, and then we go to the NumPy folder, we see there is a subfolder called linear algebra and it's got its double underscore in it, double underscore dot py file. So if we type in import numpy.lin alg as lin alg, then we are specifying this file in this folder. So from lin alg, we can now have a look at the inverse function, which will calculate the inverse matrix. So let's just assign the output to A inverse. And this is the same inverse matrix that we used in our Word document. So we know that A times A inverse is going to give us the identity matrix. So we can calculate C by multiplying B by A inverse. And remember that we need to perform array multiplication. So this gives us the same values, 1.8 and 4.6, as we, we have shown in the Word document. And we can use the function solve, which essentially carries out the same procedure as outlined above, but doesn't give us the intermediate step of telling us what the inverse matrix of A is. So for solve, we need to specify our square matrix A and our result B. And once again, this gives the same results as expected. So at the moment, matrix division may seem to be a bit abstract. However, it's quite commonly used for operations such as interpolation. So let's create an array X, and this is going to be a series of times. And then we're going to create an array Y, which is going to be velocities at said times. And so we can phrase a question, what is the velocity at time 16? And we don't actually have time 16. So how could we calculate this? Well, we could calculate this using interpolation. So let's first of all, just plot the data to see what it looks like. Okay, so we've got it shown in the plots pane and we can see our nearest value to 16 is 15. And so for our first guesstimate, we can just estimate the velocity at time 15 and say this is going to be close to the velocity at time 16. So this is our nearest, nearest point guess, and it uses a single data point. Let me just go into Word and let's have a look at the data in a bit more detail. So we've taken our nearest data point, which was x equals 15 and y equals 362.78. So instead of just using the nearest data point, can we use the two nearest data points to get a more accurate estimate? So the second nearest data point is going to be this data point at 20 and a velocity is going to be 517.35. And recall that we can construct the equation for a straight line by using two data, data points. So the equation is going to have a constant and then an x to the power one coefficient and has the following form. 
So let's write this out in matrix form. So on the right hand side, we've got our y values, which are our two velocities. So we can just type them in. And to the left hand side, we've got our equation at the two times, which are the x values. So the left hand side can be split up into a square matrix and then a column vector of the coefficients. So the coefficients are going to be C0 and C1 respectively. And then we've got 1 times C0 in each case because it's a constant. And then we've got the two times, 15 and 20, which are going to be multiplied by C1 in each case. So you'll notice that this is essentially the A, the B and the C that we had before. So we can now just go into Spider and we can input a and b as as arrays and then we can calculate c which will give us the coefficients of the um, linear fit between these two data points so let's solve for these coefficients directly using the linear algebra solve function and then putting a and b and so we've got our coefficients, which are going to be our C0 and C1, respectively. So what we want to do now is essentially substitute in our values here for C0 and C1. And then we want the X value to be 16, which is the value that we're interested in. And now we can calculate y. So y, y estimated using two data points is the following. And let me just index from the array C to get C0 and C1. And so that gives us a slightly more accurate estimation of, of the velocity at time 16. So we could make this more complicated and instead of just fitting a straight line, we could fit a quadratic equation. So this will require three data points. So let's go ahead and do this. So now what we're essentially going to do is just copy and paste the following, highlight the three nearest data points to 16. And now we're going to have an equation with um, x squared term. So this is going to give us a three by three square matrix, a three by one column vector of unknown co coefficients. And then we're going to read off the three velocities on the right hand side. Once again, the dimensions match. So we've got our three coefficients, C0, C1, and C2. C0 is a constant, and then we've got X, and we've got X squared. So we can just copy and paste the, the above, and we can add in our X squared term. And then we can add in an additional row corresponding to the third data point. So now this is going to be our estimation using three data points. So we need to update our equation. And this should be 16 squared. 
and we see that the value estimated using three data points is very similar to the value that we got when we used two data points. So instead of just using the nearest three data points, we can use the nearest four data points. And this will allow us to form a quadratic equation. So this is going to give us an x cubed term. And then we need to add to the additional data point. So once again, we need to update our equation. And this should be the third coefficient times 16 cubed. So let me just go ahead and fix that. And now, once again, we see we've got an interpolated estimate for the velocity at the time point of 16. So there is another Python library called SciPy, which can essentially just be thought of as a scientific extension for NumPy. So we've seen in NumPy, we've got the core NumPy library, and then we've got some additional modules such as the linear algebra module. And a lot of these modules were created separately in SciPy. And if they're quite commonly used, they eventually just get incorporated into NumPy as well. But if we have a look in the SciPy folder, we see that we've got additional modules. And one of them is Interpolate. So we can import this in much the same manner as we imported the linear algebra module from NumPy. So from this interpolate module, we've got this interpolate 1D function, which we can use to specify an X and Y value. And the output of this is an interpolation function. So if we create a new set of X values, then we can use this function to interpolate Y at each of these X values. Okay, so in the Variable Explorer, you're, you're going to see x1 now, and you're going to see y1. So this is our interpolated values at each value of x1. So we see we've got the same value at 16 as we did when we calculated are interpolated data using two data points, the nearest two data points around the value of 16. So that was linear interpolation, and we can also use cubic interpolation. And let us just go ahead and plot this. And if we have a look at the value of y4 at 16, we see we've got a value that's very similar to the value that we calculated earlier. There's probably some additional smoothing in this interpolation function. So that's maybe why the value is just that slightly different. Okay, so instead of interpolating the data, let's now have a look at fitting it to a function. So if we go back to the NumPy folder, we see that there is this polynomial module and there's a polynomial class within it. So we can 
from this module, import this polynomial class. And now what we're going to do is create a function where the x value and y value are fitted to a polynomial using a degree of 1. And then we can evaluate this polynomial using linear, linear space points. And our data is a tuple. So the zeroth index is going to be the new x data. And the first index is going to be the calculated y data. So we see it doesn't fit so great to a straight line. So what we can do is increase the number of degrees to 2. And we see that this fits much better across all the data points. So we can increase this to 3 if we want. And we see that it fits just slightly better. However, there's not a huge justification to select a third degree polynomial over a second degree polynomial for this particular data set. And within NumPy, we also have commonly used uh, trig, trig functions such as sine, cos, and tan. So let's just import NumPy as NP and we'll create a series of time data points from minus 2 pi to positive 2 pi and we're going to just select 100 data points. So we can use the sine function to evaluate the sine function at each of these times, the cost function to evaluate the cost function at each of these times and the tan function to evaluate the tan function at each of these times. So once again, we can view the output of these arrays. And each of these functions will use radians and not degrees by default. And we've seen the radians to degrees functions and degrees to radians functions earlier. So let's just go ahead and plot these. So I'm going to plot the sine and cos on the same figure, and then I'm going to create a separate figure to plot the tan function. So if we have a look at the sine function, we can see that the cos function is essentially the same as the sine function, except it's got a pi over two offset. And the tan function is the sine function divided by the cos function. And this is discontinuous because the sine function has zero values. And so when you divide by zero, you essentially get infinity. So that's why there's this huge kind of values here. And because we only specified 100 data points, we've not got exactly the values of sine that equal to zero where we divide by zero and essentially get infinity. If we specified more data points, we would see that the y values on this tan axis would become absolutely huge. We can also have a look at the exponential and log functions. And recall that the log of an exponential is essentially reverses the behavior of the exponential. So in this case, it should look like a straight line. So once again, let's just plot these so we can see what they look like. So there's the exponential, there's the log, and there's the log of the exponential, where the y data is essentially the same as the x data. So the log is acting on the base e We've also got the log 10, which 
works on the base 10. So if we use the log space, this uses log 10. And recall that we use scientific notation to input very small or very large numbers. So we will use a, a prefix e to, to a power. So the log 10 essentially does the opposite of this. As you, as you see above. So one other important module in NumPy is the random module, which can be used to generate random numbers. So once again, we've got this random folder and we're going to reference the double underscore in it, double underscore dot py file. So let's import NumPy random as random. And now from it, we can set the seed. So the random numbers aren't actually random, like they're randomly generated, but they're stored in a sequence. And the sequence that you get depends on the seed that you start at. So the function rand will give us a float between zero and one. And we need to specify the dimensions of the output array that we want to create. And we can unpack a tuple if we prefer. So for example, if you've got a shape that you want, then you can just specify this and unpack it as a tuple. Notice when we change the seed, the values change, and then when we change the seed back, the values are consistent. We can also use normalized random numbers, rand n, which are normalized around zero, so they're going to give us positive values and negative values, i.e. they're going to be normally distributed around zero. So we've also got the random integer function which will allow us to generate a random integer between a lower and an upper bound. And then we can specify the size as a tuple. So remember, we are inclusive of the lower bound and exclusive of the upper bound. So if we want to include 10, we're going to need to go up to 11. And the step size is always going to be one because this is a randomly generated integer and the steps between integer values is always one. We also have random choice, which can be used to select a number of choices from a list. So if we create this array of three numbers and we want a choice of two numbers, we can do this. Notice that when we change the seed that there are our choice of two numbers changes. And eventually when we change the seed, we actually get the same number twice. So when we select a number from nums, we don't remove it from nums. We would need to change the code in order to do this if that's what we wanted to do. Let's now create an X row vector. So this is going to have five columns by one row going from right to left. And now let's create a Y column vector, which is going to have one column by four rows going from right to left. And let's create a matrix Z, which is going to have five columns by four rows going from right to left. So if I create these and open them up within the variable explorer, I can overlay them. So X shows essentially the column number and Y essentially shows the row number. So this is X, Y and Z values shown in matrix form. So now that they're overlaid, it's, it's a bit more obvious. So this is an actual 3D data set. 
And it's sometimes not that convenient to have it in this format. We can use the mesh grid function on xy to basically extend x in the y direction and instead extend y in the x direction. So notice what's happened here is the row x has been copied four times, which was the dimension of y, and the column y has been copied five times, which was the dimension of x. And now x, y, and z all have matching dimensions. So when a function requires data, such as a plotting function in x, y, z format, then we've, we've got it in the correct format. Okay, so for clarity, let's just create an array x, y, z that's going to start with zeros and it's going to use this size of z for the number of rows and it's going to have three columns. So we can make the zero of column the x data and we're going to reshape this so that all the x data is on a single dimension. And we're going to make the first column the y data and the second column the z data. So now our data is in the X, Y, Z format, shown side by side in this matrix. So I think this is a fairly good place to finish this video. And I've given a fairly detailed overview of the NumPy library. So now that you're comfortable with NumPy, you should get started with the Python and data analysis library, Pandas, which works around another data structure known as a data frame. And a data frame can essentially be thought of as an Excel sheet. Once you've got comfortable with a data frame, you should go ahead and have a look at the matplotlib plotting library. And I've used some commands in this video just to demonstrate that some of the functionality of NumPy, but I cover this in a lot more detail in my matplotlib um, written guide and tutorial video. And of course, if you found this video useful, then please don't forget to share it with classmates who may also find it useful.